No? You're good? All right. Well, next slide then, maybe. Maybe, there we go, is we've gotten through addition, we've gotten through subtraction, we've gotten through multiplication, and multiplication is the weirdest of all of them so far, right? How about the matrix identity? A matrix identity, just like your, the number one, is something that when you multiply a matrix by it, you get the matrix back, right? X times one equals X, one times X equals X. But with matrices, we have to worry about pre-multiplication and post-multiplication, and the row of the pre-multiplier and the columns of the post-multiplier have to equal. So all of that works out to be the following. You can get an identity, an identity matrix that's square. This is one that's three by three, where the diagonal elements are all equal to one, and the off-diagonal elements are all equal to zero. So think about how that works. Here's A times I, that's the identity matrix. We just put an I there for it. If we post multiply A by it, we get A back. We may pre multiply A by another I. It may not be the same 3 by 3. It will have to make the dimensions conform. But we get A back as well. So, why is that the case? If we go back to a matrix like A, questions. Here is, let's just take. Uh, capital A here. Actually, no. You know what? I like it with, uh, I like these matrices that are square and symmetric, like our covariance matrix. So let's take X transpose X here. What size is X transpose X? Two by two. So if we wanted to take X transpose X, that thing, and multiply it by an identity, what size identity would we need? A two by two, right? And it would be one zero zero one. So what the, how this would work out is remember each so this new term right over here, this new matrix, this first element should come from the dot product of the first row of X times the first column of I. First row of X has this term in it, it multiplies the number one, so it's itself. And then the next term multiplies the number zero, so it goes away, and so we're left with SAT verbal squared. Right. The second column, or the second one, is the dot product of the same first row, but now the second column. Now the zero is in the first position, it knocks off a SAT verbal squared. We add it to one times SAT math times SAT verbal, and we get the thing back. So you can see how this works out with dot products, right? It's kind of an odd way of looking at it, but because the matrix multiplication is based on the dot product and going element by element, our matrix uh, identity matrix, the I thing, has to be this diagonal matrix of uh, ones. Now, I say diagonal matrix of ones. If you have a non-square matrix that you're multiplying it by, the dimensions are a little bit weirder, but you get the upper diagonal of ones for it. But, that gets to be weird. It's not a diagonal matrix then, so just, I like to think about it when it comes to square, usually symmetric matrices, and that's usually what we're dealing with. Okay, questions? No. All right. The zero vector then is literally a column vector of zeros. Seems pretty fair, right? Again, this the number of it's a vector, it's a column vector, so the number of uh, rows in this thing depend on what you're multiplying it by. And oftentimes you may have to take the transpose of it to pre-multiply it, because the matrix may have more rows to it. But then, anyway, it works the same thing as your zero, right? In algebra, not matrix, just regular algebra, x times zero is zero. Any number times zero is zero. There's no getting away from zero. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Anyone else have any zero comments or phrases that are catchy? If you go, I was looking up for your tweet, WTF Templin, I had a taught a longitudinal workshop and we made fun of phrases about time. Like my wife just wrote a book, it's about longitudinal analysis, intra-individual variability and change, and I said, just call it, it's about time. Okay. And so you'll see on the Twitter, if you search, Hashtag WTF Templin, someone posted a video of time after time. <laughs>
So we can do this with zeros also if you like. Anyway, um, finally the column of ones itself um, happens to show up, a ones vector column. It's useful for creating anything that needs to be a sum. All right, so imagine here, let's imagine we take our um, SAT math. And we multiply it by this vector, vector that's the column of ones. Usually it's denoted by the number one in boldface. Compared to the identity matrix, which is a capital I in boldface. Okay. The number one here, if we wanted to multiply, let's say, SAT math by it. Uh, so we have SAT math, and we multiply it by this one. How many uh, rows in one would we have to have? All right, so... Let's take a look here. We have SAT math. And this right here is a column vector at size 1000 by 1. If we want to multiply this by a 1's vector, for the, let's say for the purpose of coming up with a sum, right? If we wanted to pre multiply it, we just take the number 1 here, and it would have to be what? Size 1 by 1000? And that's no longer a column vector, so we could actually say this is one transpose. Right? So the vector one would be 1,000 by one. And we could post multiply it, and we'd have to do one transpose as well. Point being, this is where you can see the transpose, but look at what it would happen. The dot product would be every SAT math value in our big 1,000 by one vector times the number one added together. So what does that result in? The sum across all people of SAT math, right? Sum of x. We use sum of x in statistics still. It's like the mean, right? So actually, if I wanted to do the mean, the mean would be like this over n, right? N is a scalar. I could just take this right here and divide it by n, and guess what? I get the I get the mean. So if you're doing this in R, you can actually go along into my R slides. There's some matrix terms in there. If you wanted to compute the mean and didn't want to type the word mean, but you had the, the data is a matrix, you could just type this matrix product and it would give you the mean. N be one transpose one. Uh n itself right here? Uh, no, it's just a it's a scalar itself, so it'd be a it, it, one transpose one dot product one. One, oh yes, it would be. Yes, yes, it would be. N, <laughs> thank you, is one transpose one. All right. So this is now the number one summed up a thousand times. A thousand. Thank, thank you. you. Right there. Yes. Thank you. That's awesome. So see, this is it. This is the in a nutshell why we do this. All of a sudden, it takes an ugly sum or ugly other things and condenses it for us. Finally, and this is where the people who love matrix algebra will cringe, and those with a much more formal math training than I have will cringe. I'm going to go there. I'm going to call it the matrix inverse division. All right, we've got an addition, multiplication, and subtraction taken care of, and division is usually up there too, right? So in algebra, if we think of division, we can kind of think, play around with some algebra real quick. If we had A divided by B, we could sort of rewrite that as 1 over B times A. And then we can think of 1 over b as b to the negative one first power. The second thing, so that's, that's kind of reorganizing and trying to come up with a, the product of something that's been inverted times a number is like dividing by it. The second term is a number divided by itself gives us 1. Okay, so we put those two together and we end up with what matrix division should look like. That's why I'm sort of putting quotes around. It's not exactly division, but it's close. A matrix inverse plays a similar role. And so we're going to say A, for this purpose, is square and symmetric, remember, like a correlation matrix. So that helps move the math on this a little bit and actually makes what I'm about to say true. It's not true for every matrix, but for square symmetric matrices, this is true. An inverse, if it exists, is that a matrix such that if you pre-multiply A by it, if you come up with the identity, right? That's like this right here, A divided by A equals 1. A inverse times A equals the identity matrix, which is this column matrix, diagonal matrix of one, excuse me. 
Same thing with post multiplication. But because we're dealing with square and symmetric matrices, sure enough, this A inverse that you see in either of these is actually the same thing. For a square and symmetric matrix, it has the same number of rows as columns, so we don't have to worry about the sizes being any different. They're all the same here. So calculation of the matrix inverse is complicated. And I am not going to be the first person to tell you this. Uh, or, or I'm not going to teach you this. <laughs> We're going to skip it. We're going to say it's done on the computer. Uh, generally speaking, it involves a lot of computations. Uh, and there are some tricks to matrix algebra to make it work. Uh, some types of decomposing or, or diagonalizing matrices and using some back substitution. We don't want to get into that, but the bigger picture is computers have a hard time with this. This is where we get into problems with what we call numerical stability. If you do it in a computer the way you might learn it in a matrix algebra class, the computer result will have error to it. You have to find a way that's what we call it's numerically stable to estimate, which sounds even crazier than multicollinearity. Stability? What? Uh, anyway, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. And actually, um, well, there's a movie about uh, Alan Turing. Uh, he developed a matrix decomposition technique that we still use today to do matrix inverses. So this is a relevant term now. I know it sounds like he's a brilliant mathematician, as it were, uh, in general. But this is also an added to that legacy. I think it's called the QR decomposition, which takes a square symmetric matrix and breaks it into the triangular upper part and lower part. Stop there. Um, it's hard to do, but beyond that, not all matrices can be inverted. Right? So if you can invert, so, so for instance, A is our square symmetric matrix here. If it has an inverse, A is said to be non-singular. <laughs> Sounds weird. If A did not have an inverse, A is said to be singular. When do um, singular matrices show up in statistics? With multicollinear data, collinearity. Linear dependencies. If you have a linear dependency of the vectors that go into A, then A will not be able to be inverted. That's the, the key to all of it. Um, in computational world in computers, how close to invert, invert, inverting, inverting, uh, how close to singular is a matter of tolerance, and so it's about how much error you'll tolerate before you say no, 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 I can't do it. Um, so you'll see that sometimes, and that is actually why, believe it or not, if you look, if you do a typical regression analysis, your simple linear regression, the standard error of your estimates. So you have, you have beta hat, right, for your slope. We look at the standard error, remember the standard error, the beta hat over its standard error is a Wald test. It comes from x transpose x inverse times your error variance. Okay. So when you have linear dependency, like SAT math and verbal and total all together, this thing you can't really invert. And so the computer starts getting weird numbers, lots of error in them essentially. And if you let if it if it you let it go, you say the tolerance is low enough that this, you can do this. That's where the standard error becomes really really big, because it's dividing by a number, it's infinitesimally small, and it just blows the whole thing up. It's kind of weird. So that's what that happens. So um, this is an example. Uh, I had my x transpose x matrix. There's the inverse of it, and if I do this in R, you see those numbers aren't exactly one. Uh, sorry, our very small numbers, excuse me. These are very, very small numbers right here. This inverse right here. If you go back and multiply them together, which I don't do, but I do. you can do it with my R syntax online if you felt like it, you'll see that you don't exactly get the identity matrix back, the diagonal matrix of ones. You'll see in the off diagonal, like a very small fractional value sometimes, like point, point oh, 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 one or something like that. So that's, that's that precision, numerical precision that we're, we're worrying about. This is, gets into computer science a little bit, which is something I struggle with. Questions? I bet you're thinking, how does all this apply to me and what we do? And that's a good thing to think. Oh, by the way, here's some more matrix trivia. When you're playing Trivial Pursuit with people, here you go. If someone says, hey, uh, is scalar multiplication distributive? Well, yes, yes it is. It's right here. 
Good way to get out of conversations, too. <laughs> Someone starts talking to you and you don't want them to, like you're at a bar, you know how that goes. Like, you know, I'm just studying matrix algebra. Do you know how to find a determinant? <laughs> Never mind. Um, so what we're doing with, why we did all that is because we're going to build up to a multivariate normal distribution. And what shows up in a multivariate normal distribution <laughs> is not only the covariance matrix, but also its inverse. Right, actually, just the inverse of it. There's also another part that invo is involved with something called the determinant, but we'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But before we get there, remember, we're trying to describe joint distributions of variables, or multivariate distributions. And one of those very common one that shows up is something called the bivariate normal distribution. It sounds so classic, bivariate, but uh, it means two variables. You have variable x, variable y. Here it is. Or x1 and x2. Boy, that thing is ugly. I had to put that onto two lines. And this is actually why matrices will help. If we didn't know matrix algebra, this is what the bivariate normal distribution would do. Remember, you know, you have to know the two pieces of data, x1 and x2, and you plug them in, and if you know all the parameters, then you get the height again, right? That's all this is doing. It's just giving us the height of both these observations, knowing the parameters. But what are the parameters? Well, pi, again, is 3.14. It's not a parameter. It's a constant. This is sigma, one, sigma x1 is standard deviation of x1. That's one parameter. Standard deviation of x2, that's 2. Rho, that's correlation. That's 3. And then this is all looks like the beginning of the last normal distribution. And then we have this e to the z. And z is a placeholder for all this ugliness down here. Where we have the other parameters, we have mu for x1 and mu for x2. So if we know how many parameters we have, we have five, right? Two means, two standard deviations or variances, whatever you want to pick, and one correlation between the two. So if you know all of that, then you plug in x1 and you plug in x2 and you get the height. And this formula right here gave you the plot of that bivariate normal that we started with in the slides uh, that was up next to the chi-square back in the day, way back two hours ago. All right. Does that look ugly or what? I had to look this thing up too. So if you're thinking like it's all up here, uh-uh. Here's what a bivariate normal does. On the left is a sh the shape of it. Um, so this is like variable x1 down this axis, variable x2 down that axis. And then the shape of it is governed by the values we plug in for means. And this is the covariance matrix. I've actually squared the variance, the standard deviations, that's from the previous slide, and then changed correlation into covariance. So that's sigma x1, x2 is really rho, which is our correlation, times sigma x1, standard deviation of x1, times standard deviation of x2. That's what that thing is, it's a covariance. You don't have to do anything more than think of this rho goes between negative one and one, and we multiply it by these things that are in terms of the units of the variables. We've just made this, this term on terms of its units, it has units too. So I have picked this distribution to have a shape where the mean for x, the first variable was zero, the mean for the second variable was zero. The variance for the first variable was one, the variance for the second variable was one, and the covariance was zero. Incidentally, zero covariance means zero correlation. It's one thing we can't agree on. So what matrix does that look like? It's an identity matrix, right? Pretty cool. Okay, cool, got it. And what, what's this look like, actually? What vector does that look like? A zero vector, right? All right, that's what I'm thinking, right? Just labels, that's what we end up doing. Um, <coughs> this thing on the left is the height that that function gives you for any pair of coordinates for x1 and x2. It's like, okay, I observe this value for x1 and this value for x2. It tells you how relatively likely that pair happened together. And so it's hard to see this because it's three dimensions. So this graph on the right is kind of like if you flew over the top of it and looked down, it's a contour map. Have you been hiking before? Have you looked at contour maps? I'm trying to remember. I, I lasted just like in high school. I, I dropped it. I did drop out of Boy Scouts. 
back when they were hiking and stuff. That's where I remember from them from the, the most. But if you go to Google Maps, there's a contour button. You'll see a bunch of lines. They represent equal height, equal altitude from sea level. This is equal height. This is the mountain that we're looking at right here. So everything in this circle has equal relative frequency. So you can think about any two points that you can come up with. If they fall on any circle, that's how relative frequent they are. The middle part right here, the center of the distribution, is still given by the mean. Mean of x, the mean of y. Mean of x1, mean of x2. So it's both at zero. That's the location. The variance, now, I haven't changed this yet, but really what this is telling us is how stretched out this contour would be. So the variance of x1, if this was x1 down here, if it was bigger than 1, it would be stretched out further. If it was smaller than 1, it would be shorter. Right? And the same thing with x2. If it was bigger than 1, it would be stretched out longer. If it was smaller, it would be squished. Right? Just like variance worked in our univariate normal case where we had really peaked versus very flat. Right? The covariance is fun. It's like this right here. What does this matrix look like? It's like a covariance matrix, but the variances are 1. That means this thing's a correlation. This is a correlation matrix. Correlation matrix is a covariance matrix where all the diagonal elements are equal to 1. A standardized variable covariance. This, now, you can almost envision it happening. If you were to sample data where you have the distribution that looked like this, all of your plots, all your points would be in this where these circles are. That's where the mass of the distribution is. So you're much more likely to find points, observations, or pairs of observations that are in the middle. You'd have a scatter plot that kind of looks like that oval. Right? In fact, the higher this correlation gets, the tighter the ovals get. It's more elongated. If we were to have a negative value of correlation there in the other direction, right? we'd be going the other way. The same thing would happen. So this is what it looks like with zero correlation. They're everywhere, perfectly random. In fact, in the bivariate normal distribution, x and y are said to be independent, statistically independent. You have no knowledge of the other based on one when this happens. It's the only distribution that we frequently use where that's the case. There's, a, of course, a statistical definition with that, but we'll leave that for some other time. So how are we doing? That's the plot. I can do bivariate normal in plotting. If we had like a 10 variate normal, we wouldn't have a plot for it. But the same concepts still apply. If you get stuck with it, the main picture is this. What we're after, what we're going for next week, in fact, we'll have data. We'll, observe, we'll have observed data. We won't know what the mean vector is. We won't know what the covariance matrix is. Okay. So we're going to have to use the computer to find the mean vector and the covariance matrix that gives us the shape of the distribution with the biggest peak. That's where we're going with this. So again, matrix algebra has to get us there, and it's really complicated, but it still works the same. We plug in our data, we get a height. Next week it'll be, we have our data, we have to plug it in, but we're going to try out values of means and try out values of variances, and we'll get a height. All right. Does that work okay? You can work with heights. Okay, so when we get to more than two variables, we typically see this expressed in matrices. That's where it starts getting ugly. So let's imagine we have a person. This is x sub p. This is their data. They have capital V observations. So we go out in the world and we collect, let's say, a 50 item survey. Each one of those items represents a variable, a random variable in this sense. So that person, for that person, all their items together would have 50 columns in this vector. A 50 by 1. If we were to know what the mean vector was for all 50, and if we were to know what the covariance matrix was for all 50 of these things, we could plug in this person's data into this formula, including the matrices, and it would just give us one number back. It'd be a height. Right? Whether we have one variable, whether we have 50, whether we have 5,000, it works the same. You plug all the, the data in, you get a height back. So this is the formula. In this formula, it starts to sort of look like that normal distribution from before. Here's how you know it's a normal. I always like to say this. If you see the, 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 the 2 pi anywhere in a function, 2 pi, normal. Right? That's your diagnosis for normal. 
2 pi has shown up in several different ways. In the univariate normal, it was under this, the radical, the square root. In the bivariate normal, it was uh, out by itself, not under anything. And now in a multivariate normal, it's raised the power of the number of variables, capital V, divided by 2. All right. So when we have one variable, that's actually like saying this is square root of pi over 2. We have two variables, that's 2 over 2, or it's just itself. Okay. Now, do you remember the univariate normal other part that was under the radical? It's okay if you don't. I do. Square, it's the square, the, 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 the sigma squared. That's it. I gotta talk. Don't drink it, break. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> Makes you wonder what's in my little bottles over here. Um, Sigma squared was under the radical. That is like our variance covariance matrix. In fact, for one variable, it's the variance. It's like the thing up in the, the diagonal. It was raised to the one half, or uh, raised to the negative one half power before. Actually, down here it was raised to one half power. Sigma squared to one half power. What this sigma right here represents is our variance and covariance matrix over variables. Not correlation, but variance and covariance. And so when we deal with uh, models that deal with multivariate normal, all of our parameters come in the form of things that deal with variances and covariances rather than standard deviations and correlations. So that's why we keep focusing on this term. It's the natural form they show up in the distribution. What these bars on the other side of sigma happen to represent is something called the determinant of the matrix. I did not put the slide in there. A determinant is found, again, through a very intense computational way but it's a one number characterization. And if your matrix is square and symmetric, that number can tell you whether or not you can invert the matrix. Right? So if the number is positive, your matrix, if this determinant is positive, then your matrix is said to be uh, positive definite. Which sounds like, yeah, uh, you, can you invert it? Yeah, definite, positive definite. It's like saying a double affirmative. Do you want to go to the game this weekend? Yeah, definite, positive definite. I want to go to the game this weekend, right? Um, this thing, because it's raised to a one half power, there's only certain things that it can be, right? Number one, it's in the denominator, so it cannot be zero, right? The last I heard, dividing by zero is undefined. Maybe we've started to define it, I don't know. There's lots of fuzzy math out there but it's undefined. So it can't be zero, which by the way, a zero determinant means it's a positive semi-definite matrix. That's like, yeah, maybe, I've, I've got to take the dog out, but otherwise I might be able to make the game. I don't know, I'm trying to make it more, you know, not just matrices. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, K-State this weekend, I know that much. The red and the blue hues on top of each other make it purple. Anyway, this thing has to be not zero, and because it's actually the square root of something, it's got to be positive. Otherwise, we'll start getting into imaginary numbers. Now, I remember when I was going through all this math and it was looking like a blur, which it may do you right now, which is totally cool. Uh, I used to think, well, I, when they start putting imaginary numbers and statistics, that's when I'll pay attention. I haven't gotten there yet. But no, anyway, this thing has to be positive. It, has to, it cannot be zero. Right, so that means that we can find the inverse of that covariance matrix. So by implication, that means that our data cannot have any linear dependencies. It cannot be collinear or multicollinear, however you like to call it, and still be multivariate normal. Weird, right? Okay, so that's the, the denominator. We still have EXP, which is really 2.7. And now in the numer in the uh, upper part up here, this is a little weird. Remember before we had in the uh, in the exponent, we had x minus mu squared. Let's take a look at it first. Uh, divide, actually, divided by two sigma. <coughs> All right. I could re-express this a little bit differently if I took x minus mu and multiplied it by x minus mu. Right. Right? That's essentially what I get, and sure enough, that's actually what's happening when we split these two up. This is like saying x minus mu squared, something transposed by itself. It's like a square. It's not quite. We get the op diagonal involved in that. What about that sigma squared? You know, it's a denominator again, but remember that trick? If we said that was really sigma to the negative 2, 
we could take it out of the denominator and put it right up here, right there. It's its inverse, and that's what this happens. This sigma inverse shows up in the numerator. So all of this together gives you the formula that you just saw for two. If we only had two variables, we could do the matrix algebra and come up with that last formula we just saw that took up two sections of slides. If we only had one variable, this formula becomes the univariate normal thing that we saw when we started class. Right. So this is a very, um, in statistics, the word is elegant. <laughs> when you say the word elegant, you probably don't think matrices. That's a very elegant way of displaying a lot of information for however many variables we happen to be. So that's all the terms that go into it. Questions? Isn't that elegant? It's nice. Anyway, this is the slide that describes how we get from one to the other. But yeah, a one variable value, uh, one variable shoved into this, remember a one variable is like a column vector of data, or actually not even that, it's a scalar. All this works out to give you exactly the value that shows up from the univariate normal. What's the covariance matrix? The size of the covariance matrix is equal to the number of variables by number of variables. That's kind of the key to this. I should go back to this. The covariance matrix, it's just like a correlation matrix, right? Number of rows equals number of variables, number of columns equals number of variables, right? Square. Size of the mean vector, number of rows equals number of variables, and one column. So there are two matrices that describe the shape of this multivariate normal distribution. First is the mean vector, that's the location. The second is the covariance matrix. The variances describe each variable's spread in each dimension, and the covariances talk about how kind of oval-like, elliptical the distribution happens to be in a pair of dimensions. But on that, let's just imagine what happens when we have one variable here. What's the size of the covariance matrix for one variable? One by one. It's sigma squared. Right, so that would show up here, and that would show up here. Right, and what's the size of the mean vector? It's one by one, it's just mu x1. It would show up here, and it would show up here, and all x would be would be the first observation, x1. It would show up in both places. And that's how you get from here back to the start for one variable. So we went through, have you ever seen uh, Ron White? Remember the old blue collar comedy tour? Uh, you probably have heard it. It was like mid 2000s, Comedy Central. I, I saw him once in grad school with a buddy, yeah, way back when. Uh, but he tells a story. He's like, well, I told you that story to tell you this one. It basically, it was uh, his nickname or his alias when he was busted by the police was Tater Salad. Anyway, he told it, I told you that story to tell you this one. That we told you the matrix algebra to tell you the multivariate normal is like Tater Salad. It gives us the ability to describe things. Oh, one last thing. Um, just because I like this word. The term of the exponent, this part right here, take a look at what it happens to be under a, a one variable. It's the distance from uh, your observation to the mean that's been standardized, right? Or it's the squared standardized distance, right? Kind of like your squared z-score. For multiple variables, it means the same thing, but it has a special name. It's called the Mahalanobis distance, the squared Mahalanobis distance. Mahalanobis, <laughs> mind you, might be the name of the child that's on the way for me. Due in March, what do you think? I think I'll go propose that to her tonight. We'll see what she has to say. Can we name him Mahalanobis? And the follow-up will be, well, what about a middle name? <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's, it's a funny thing. It literally is, it's called a squared statistical difference, distance. So if you have a multivariate set of data, you have this one person's observation. It's like saying, if you go back to this plot, okay, so here, here's this two-dimensional space. I have this person out over here. How far is, are they 
from the center of the distribution in standard units. Right, so how many, how far this way and then that way do you have to go to get to the peak? That's what it's telling you. Mahalanobis. It, uh, it actually shows up in things like multidimensional scaling and all sorts of stuff. And, and ironically, if you want to talk about chi-square again, wrap it all together, that thing, if you look at all of your data, if it's multivariate normal, then everybody's Mahalanobis distance squared will follow a chi-square distribution. Whoa! Stat trivia right here. Okay, so where do we go with all this? Holy cow. Um, multivariate normal shows up everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean what we did with linear models, ANOVA regression, if you did multivariate, NANOVA. Linear mixed models, HLM, multi-level models, and so forth. Uh, it shows up in structural equation models. In fact, remember this diagram I had last week? This is our factor. And then we had data x1, x2, all the way to x5. Something like that. Our five pieces of data were the things that formed the multivariate dis normal distribution. Right. So that would have, what's the size of that covariance matrix for these five pieces of data? Five by five, right? So this is. This is sigma, it's five by five. Cannot drive fives on that side. I don't know what to do. So what ends up happening in that right there, the math for it works out so that if you were to come up with, if you took each of the factor loadings, each of the regression weights that multiplied the factor in each of these regressions, and put them into a matrix called lambda, right? it would be a five by one matrix. And if it multiplied lambda by itself, the transpose, right? The 5 by 1 times a 1 by 5 gives us a 5 by 5. And then we took all of the residual or error unique variances for these and put them in a diagonal matrix psi. What this path diagram, or the model it implies, specifies a very specific structure for our covariance matrix. What? Right? And this is what's going to set up next week. Right? There's a covariance matrix. Right? Just think of what happens to the covariance matrix. One variable, the covariance matrix has one term, sigma squared. But two variables, they have three terms. Sigma squared one, sigma squared two, and the covariance. Okay? But three variables, right? there are six terms. See where this is going? But ten variables. right? So the number of terms in the covariance matrix goes up in this quadratic function as the number of variables you collect goes up linearly. Right? So if you're building a scale and you have five items, that's great. But what if you say, oh, let's put 10 items on there. You've just made this matrix go from 5 to 10. And to summarize that, every time that you take, every time that you add another variable, uh, every variable, every thing that you're trying to estimate, it's like, uh, it's like economics, right? Your data are your currency. You only collect so many data, there's only so many of these things that you can estimate accurate, accurately. So we sometimes need to limit that, and this is one way. We can say, well, what if these things measure one factor? Right? The math behind it works out such that we build a covariance matrix and saying, if this was true, if this structure was true, we should see a covariance matrix that results in a very specific structure. And instead of having uh, five, instead of having 15 var values in it, f for five variables, there's actually 15 terms we'd have to estimate. What we actually have is 10. Right? So can we get away with doing what we what normally would need 15 to do with 10? Right? Or if we wanted to think about it, 10 or even more, the differences would be more glaring. And that's the process of what we're going to do in SEM. It's a multivariate model. It's a multivariate technique. We have this covariance matrix that we have to get right. We're not allowed to go differently from it. And so what we're hypothesizing are structures. This is the science behind it. Oh, yeah, we have happiness. This is what we're measuring. If the science is true, we should see this structure. It's a testable hypothesis. Okay. If we go and estimate this and don't see this structure, what do we do? We reject the hypothesis. So this is why today existed. 
was because we have a lot of things we have to convert, cover if we're going to assume this multivariate normal distribution. And if we don't cover all of them and do it in a way that fits just as well as if we fit, estimated all of them, then uh, our hypotheses aren't correct and any inferences that we make on it will not be correct either. Right? You can imagine the, uh, you know, do you ever get the uh, KU Today email that comes out that talks about certain research studies or people who get grants or whatever else? Can you imagine how that would feel if we had to redact one of those because, oh yeah, happiness didn't really fit. It wasn't really happiness, it was like garbage and yeah, it didn't, you know. It wouldn't work as well, right? Now that's what we're worried about. So this, is, this, this serves the foundation for all that we do in this class. So, a couple other notes, and then we'll, uh, I'll open up for maybe if you have questions about homework or something like that. Um, these are a couple other neat things that happen with the multivariate normal. It's one of the most convenient distributions in the world to work with. The world. Yeah, there's a distribution in Houston, I think, that works really well. It sounds this no. Sometimes I just say things really, really ridiculously. It's kind of <laughs> stupid. I'm sorry. Um, Anyway, if you take your variables that are in X, if X is multivariate normal, then linear combinations of all the variables that are in X, remember a linear combination, add things together, sum it up, those linear combinations are normally distributed. Also, any subset of the variables that you have, if they're all multivariate normal, then any one variable or any pair or anything else, they're all multivariate normal, which is also Furthermore, a zero covariance between any pair of variables says that those two variables are independent, statistically independent. There are absolutely no dependency whatsoever. That is not the case, for instance, if these are, imagine instead of continuous data, we had categorical data, that would not be true. A zero covariance does not necessarily mean the variables are independent. So, kind of an interesting phenomenon there. And finally, um, conditional distributions. So if we do a regression with multivariate data, then that conditional distribution is guaranteed to be multivariate normal too. We actually rely on pretty much all of those to do SCM, although this is the last time you'll hear it out of my mouth this semester, most likely. So more trivia for you. So in terms of the wrap up, why is this important to you for use with SCM? Why is random variables important for SCM? Because random variables can be anything. They have any distribution out there, and the same thing works with what we do. We just say, hey, that thing's normal, or that thing's Bernoulli, or that thing's chi-square. I think uh, I'm debating, it'd be kind of fun. Everything that I'm going to teach you will apply, even if the variables change. There'll be a few nuances that change here or there, but the, the nuts and bolts of what we're doing, how we interpret the results, what they mean, what they stand for, will stay the same. And so I could say, oh yeah, here's a test. Not, I will not do this, but I can envision this happening. Saying, Here's a brand new distribution. It's one that's called Cauchy. Ever heard of the Cauchy distribution? I don't know what it's used for. But it exists. You can go to Wikipedia and see it. We could do SCM with it. It still would apply. Uh, what are the two parameters of the univariate normal? Mean, standard variance, or standard deviation. Either one will be acceptable. Uh, what do they govern? Location. Spread, and or some synonym with either of those. What are the two matrices? What are matrices? What is R? What are matrices? They're boxes of data, uh, and we can do basic algebra algebraic operations that we do like with any regular data. They only just become much more elaborate. And the two distributions, two matrices that govern the multivariate normal, <laughs> the mean vector, the covariance matrix. And again, the mean vector governs the multivariate location in multiple dimensions. And the covariance matrix describes the spread, or how much actually, here we go again, the determinant of the covariance matrix actually describes the volume of a hypercube formed by all the vectors in a multidimensional space. Well, okay, sorry, makes you think about volume. But yeah, it's, it's um, spread, largely, largely spread. Okay, uh, now, this is all wrapping up what I just said. One thing I didn't talk about that you could, and you usually get an ex inspecting normality. Are my data normal? Have you ever had to do that before? Yeah. A lot of times that you had to do it before, it didn't matter. 
If you had to do it for like before you did regression analysis and you looked at your x's or your y, it doesn't matter. It's not the data, that's the marginal distribution. You need the conditional distribution to be more normal. So it's an odd thing, but it's a tricky thing. Also, that what we do. So we're not actually going to, to check it, although we could. So next week, we are going to talk about taking these matrix forms and the multivariate normal and estimating the covariance matrix and the mean vector using something called linear models. We're going to go back and do, instead of one regression, we're going to do four or five. I can't remember the example from next week. I think it's actually four. Maybe two. I don't know. Two, four, something like that. Two variables. And so we're going to estimate these things, but you're going to see there's a lot of different flavors of matrices that we can throw in there. It's just to kind of get you thinking about that. And the week following that, we're going to start dive into path analysis and all of the work because that applies too. Do you have any questions for me in the last three minutes? Okay, once again, office hours Monday afternoon or email me for an appointment or email me if you have questions about homework. That also works well too. It's good to see you. Have a good week. Oh, do you question, Kim? No, sold. Yeah, stretch. Please. Class is over. Have a good evening. <laughs>